Sundays ago, three of our young people, oh, hello, a few of our young people were baptized. I, I don't think, uh, there, there's few things that I enjoy more than, uh, than being a part of baptisms at GBC. There's, there's something really special about that. Part of, part of why I love baptisms is because a few weeks before uh, people are baptized, I get to meet with them and, and hear their testimony of salvation you know, when they um, when God opened their eyes, when God exposed their sin, gave them a new life as they repented and, and put their faith in Jesus' death on the cross. And it never gets old to hear the, the glorious uh, gospel, that, those glorious gospel truths from, from a seven-year-old or from a 17-year-old. Back, seven, uh, back in November of last year, we were preparing for another baptism and um, I had a, a written, one of those written testimonies from one of our baptism candidates, um, uh, Peyton Kendall, one of our teens. I was reading it as I sat in our van uh, in a park, grocery parking lot waiting for my wife to, to, to finish, to come out of the store. So I was just sitting there in the van with the, the windows rolled down, and um, all of a sudden I had a, I saw a man kind of, I sensed kind of a man approaching the vehicle. You know, you get that that idea, and, and so you look up, and sure enough, there's this guy coming through the parking lot. It was pretty obvious he was looking for, um, for money. You know, he was asking for money, and so um, before he approached the vehicle, and before he asked for money, he saw that I was reading, and so he said, what are you reading? And I said, well, um, I am reading a testimony uh, that a 17-year-old in our church is going to be sharing before getting baptized on Sunday to publicly uh, proclaim, declare his faith in Jesus. And then I, I just asked the guy, you mind if I read it for you? And he said, sure, why not? So I, I sat there, and um, in a Stater Brothers parking lot, I read Peyton Kendall's testimony, uh, which included this like, clear presentation of the gospel uh, for this man who was, who was looking for loose change uh, to put gas in his car. Uh, I ended up um, praying with a man, um, helping him with, with some gas, but more importantly, I shared something invaluable with that man that day. I shared the gospel. Um, that is essentially what evangelism is. As defined in, in Foundations of GBC, document I'll talk about later, evangelism is proclaiming the good news of salvation in Jesus and calling people to respond with repentance and faith. Now, it's not every, every day that, you, uh, that some random person basically asks you to read the gospel for them. Um, so I, I want to share one more story with you uh, that's similar, but it's kind of in reverse. I think it, it may apply a little bit more uh, directly to you. There was once a successful politician. Uh, he held a position in government as, as minister of finance. And though he had one of the best jobs that you could, you could ask for, he was searching for something more. And so he, um, he took his, his questions about God um, and and, and took this trip, drove across the country uh, hundreds of miles to meet with some prestigious religious leaders. Uh, he wanted to understand more about God. He wanted to worship God. And unfortunately, he didn't get his question answered. His questions answered that day. And, and so he, he began his, his long drive back home. And on that trip, as he was being driven back to his house, uh, he took, uh, he was reading one of the, a, a copy of God's word that had been that had been given to him, um, or that he had purchased from those religious leaders. And the, as, he's, as he's making his way back home, a Christian approaches his vehicle and, and asks him if he understands what he's reading. And I'll pick up the true story in Acts 8, 35. Then Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, the man was reading, Isaiah 53, he told him the good news about Jesus. The author of Acts describes Philip as an evangelist, Acts 21, and I believe this story here in Acts 8, um, this story of evangelism uh, to, to the man from Ethiopia can give us some really great encouragement for our personal evangelism in our lives. What I'd like to do today is to start by giving you um, a compelling portrait of an evangelist. What, what Philip um, Philip's example in Acts teaches us about personal evangelism. And then secondly, I'll take um, a good, good chunk of our sermon to, to explain our, our church's philosophy of evangelism. 
how that relates to your personal evangelism. So there's kind of the roadmap for where we're going today. Um, this is, just going to say up front, this is going to be a pretty different sermon uh, in some ways than what you would usually hear on Sunday at GBC. Um, but I think it's important. For, for some of you, this is going to be um, kind of a reminder of who we are, what we do, and yet for some of you, um, this will be kind of the first time that you're hearing all of this. What is our philosophy on evangelism? And so uh, I'd encourage you, uh, come talk to us if you have questions um, afterwards. We'd love to, we'd really love to talk with you about this, this topic more. I also just want to say that this sermon is not meant to, it's not designed to make you feel guilty. You know, you need to be, um, you're not evangelizing enough. I, it's really my hope that you'll walk, to, you'll walk away today encouraged motivated about evangelism because you catch a vision of two essential things. One, the goal of evangelism, which is to make faithful followers of Jesus for the glory of God. And secondly, the means of salvation through the power of God's spirit and with helpful resources that are grounded in God's word. So my goal today is that you would walk away encouraged and equipped and excited uh, to evangelize for the glory of God. Let's just stop now and pray that God would, God would make that happen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from our sin. Thank you for the word of Christ that, that reveals the beauty of the gospel. I thank you for the body of Christ that, that can build us up and strengthen us for the work of ministry. Thank you for the spirit of Christ that is, that is in us, that guides us into the truth and, and propels us to share the good news with others. Father, work in our hearts today for the glory of Christ. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Would you turn with me to Acts 8 and your copy of God's Word? We've already read a, a few verses there in Acts 8 about Philip there at the end of, of the chapter. But Philip's evangelism actually begins at the beginning of, of chapter 8. Verse 1 records that the church in Jerusalem was scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria because of the persecution um, that was led by Saul after Stephen's death. We, you can read about that in the previous chapter. And yet, Acts 8 verse 4 says that those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And here Philip is mentioned. Now this, this portrait of Philip in Acts 8 teaches us a few things about evangelism. Number one, evangelism can come out of suffering. Evangelism can come out of suffering. And verse 5 says that, uh, that Philip went down to Samaria, proclaiming to them the Christ. Now, Philip's Christian brothers and sisters were being killed in Jerusalem. He probably had to leave his home. He left his, his work. Maybe he even left his family. Philip had a doubtless experienced loss, but that didn't keep him from sharing the good news, because when everything seems like bad news, that's, that's when the good news shines all the brighter. So look for those opportunities. Evangelism can come out of suffering. You know, this might involve you sharing the hope of the gospel with someone who, um, with someone else who's really suffering, but I think, as this passage indicates, many times the most powerful evangelism opportunities come when you're suffering. Have you ever thought about um, your job loss or your, uh, your health diagnosis or personal injury, something in your life as, as an occasion to share the gospel with others? Evangelism can come out of suffering. See that in Acts 8. Secondly, evangelism does not discriminate and this should go without saying, but um, yet since the first century, there have been those who, who hesitate in sharing the gospel with others who are different than them, of an ethnicity or social status or skin color or background. Samaria was not the type of place you would imagine finding uh, a Jewish Christian, and, and yet that's where Philip went to share the gospel. Evangelism, evangelism doesn't discriminate based on gender, nationality, worldview, social status, because regardless of where you are from or what your background is, we all need the gospel, the, the good news about Jesus that can set us free from, from sin and from death. Philip didn't hesitate about talking to that Ethiopian who had a different ethnicity, a different social status, because evangelism does not discriminate. 
Number three, evangelism may be inconvenient. I mean, verse 26, if you look down, when the angel of the Lord um, tells Philip to go to the road uh, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, the, the author describes the place as a desert place. Uh, approaching a, a prestigious government official um, who's in a moving chariot on a dusty roadway in the desert doesn't really sound like the, the ideal, uh, the perfect scenario for a, for a gospel encounter. And that's, but that's where God told Philip to go. Evangelism may be inconvenient. I, just think about Paul and Silas for a moment. <laughs> Giving the gospel in, in a dirty, a stinky, um, dark jail, Acts 16, Philippi. Consider the, the final two verses of the book of Acts. It says, um, Paul lived there in Rome two whole years at his own expense, and he welcomed all who came to him. I mean, he was in house arrest, waiting for his trial. He was there in house arrest, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Most of us will, will never, you know, be in that type of situation of preaching Christ, share the gospel. But um, what is your point of inconvenience? Have you, ever, have you ever seen an opportunity to share Christ and, and, and you avoided the person, you were just kind of like, it doesn't really fit in my schedule. You know, I, I have to move on. I have, I have something else to do. You know, beyond just the inconvenience of meeting with an Ethiopian there in, in the desert, what about the practicality of what Philip is doing? I mean, why would Philip have left Samaria when it seems like it says that many were being healed there in Acts 8? It says that many were being saved and baptized as he proclaimed Christ and preached the good news. Why leave when a good thing is going? And that leads us to our, our next observation about evangelism, which is evangelism must be spirit-led. Evangelism must be spirit-led. And in verse 26, it was God's spirit through an angel that, that told Philip to go down to that specific road. Um, and in verse 29, it was God's spirit who told Philip to go over to join the chariot. From, from the very beginning of the book of Acts, it's obvious that it's, this is not just um, a book of the Acts of the Apostles, which is how we usually refer to Acts, the, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, it's, it's the book of the Acts of the Spirit of Christ, through his apostles. Right, Jesus sends the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, and from that first day at Pentecost, thousands are evangelized. Philip would not have evangelized that Ethiopian if he was not led by the Spirit. And you will not reach people that God wants you to reach with the gospel unless you are you're walking in step with the Spirit. Evangelism must be Spirit-led. And when God prompts you to, to turn the conversation with a neighbor to, to their relationship with God, when you're talking to a, you know, a coworker about, uh, you know, catastrophe, like the, like the, um, was the condo that, that collapsed in Miami, you have an opportunity to, to talk about, about death and um, eternity. Remember that you're not walking into that conversation alone. The Spirit of God is leading you, and it's, it's, it's really the Spirit of God that, that alone is able to save that person. And so you're simply a messenger with the good news. But what do you say? <laughs> you've gotten in that situation. How do I actually, um, what do I talk to them about? You know, how do I present the gospel? That brings us to our final observation um, about evangelism here in Acts 8. Evangelism is all about Jesus. Seems kind of obvious, but it, it's not always obvious in our evangelism, right? Acts 8.12 says that Philip preached to the Samaritans good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Then later with the Ethiopian, it says that Philip opened his mouth and beginning with Isaiah 53, he told him the good news about Jesus. It's simply stated in the chorus of the song, For the Cause, Christ we proclaim the name above every name, for all creation, every nation, God's salvation through the Son. Philip wasn't sharing a message about um, hope, about uh, freedom from Roman persecution, um, or, or, you know, the Roman oppression that they had there, or Saul's persecution. He wasn't just sharing about your best life now. Um, he's sharing about eternal life to come through Jesus Christ. 
He didn't merely preach about ethics or or, um, church attendance. He, He preached about Jesus' death on the cross for the sins of mankind. Evangelism is all about Jesus, the author of salvation, the centerpiece of the gospel. So if you're witnessing to someone, um, and you want to, but you, you don't know really, um, you want to share the gospel, but you don't know really what to say, um, one, one idea would be to consider this question. Ask them, who do you think Jesus was? Um, it's possible that, yeah, so you could, you could ask them, the typical question is, you know, what, how's your relationship with God, or, or are you a Christian, something like that, and what do you get in the response to that? Everybody just answers the, in, the, in the affirmative, right? Yeah, I'm a Christian, I have a church. Ask them, who is Jesus? Who do you believe he was? And after they, they comment on that, um, dep- you know, they may have a, a good answer. He was God, he was a man who lived here on earth, he, he did a lot of good things. Once they respond, they'll probably give you a chance to, to answer. And, and there are so many ways that you could take this. I mean, you could talk about Jesus as the creator, John, 3, John 1, Colossians 1. You, you could talk about Jesus as the perfect man, 1 Peter 2, 2 Corinthians 5. The savior, Luke 2, 1 Timothy 1. The high priest in all over Hebrews. The king, the ruler of all. The door, the way, the truth, the life. And, and each one of these leads into a, a, an explanation, not just of who he was, but, but what he has done for them. So that's, that's one way that you could, you could lead right into a gospel presentation. But the fact is, our evangelism must be about Jesus. It's not just about having a better life, or, um, or even making your, you know, having your kids turn out well. It's, it's about Jesus. It's about, it's about his his death on the cross that saves us from our sins. So in this brief portrait of an evangelist in Acts 8, and we really have just kind of flown through this section, but um, I want to encourage you with some observations about evangelism. Evangelism can come out of suffering. Evangelism does not discriminate. It, it may be inconvenient. It must be spirit-led, and, and it's all about Jesus Christ. But Acts 8 is just one portrait from a whole gallery of portraits that we have uh, there in the book of Acts. People being evangelized and, and believing in Jesus Christ. And there's something else that occurs in, consistently in all those portraits throughout Acts. As we read about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, or Aeneas of, of Lydda, or Gentiles in Caesarea, or the thousands that came to Christ on the day of Pentecost. In each case, we find the same pattern. They believed, and then they were baptized, and then um, they were baptized as part of the, the body of Christ, the church. And so the big question that we're trying to tackle today is, is this. What's the relationship between your personal evangelism and your local church? What, what responsibilities does the local church as a group have in relationship to evangelism? That's why we've titled this The Role of Church in Evangelism. And in order to answer that question, I I want to take you to our mission statement um, in our ministry priorities. When you put together our our mission statement and ministry priorities, um, they form what we call foundations of Grace Bible Church. Um, Basically, foundations of GBC includes a mission statement, which reminds us um, why we exist. And then the ministry priorities, um, uh, the six ministry priorities explain how we accomplish the mission. And so let's go ahead and just read our mission statement. Would you read it with me? I think you have it there on your handout. Um, we're just going to read there, uh, starting, starting for the glory of God. Ready? For the glory of God, Grace Bible Church exists to make faithful followers of Christ who pursue Christ-like maturity together by growing to know more of God's unique greatness— seeking to value him above everything else, and living to make him known to others. If you have a pencil or a pen, you might just want to just circle that line. I think it's the second, uh, third line there. Make faithful followers of Christ. So then in connection with our mission statement, our six GBC ministry priorities, uh, which you have listed there below on your handout, they explain how we make faithful followers of Christ. They, They lay out these six biblical priorities that we must have as a local church 
in order to accomplish our mission. Uh, in fact, you could go ahead and just draw an arrow from uh, what you circled there, make faithful followers of Christ. Just draw an arrow down to those six priorities. So you see the connection there. Those priorities are how we, we do that. We make faithful followers. You know, I should note here, um, before we get into this, that our foundations booklet um, expands on each one of these priorities um, with an explanation and Bible to back it up. And so um, I'll be using some of the wording from, from foundations of, of GBC. Uh, if you want to pick one of those up, um, I think we have a number of copies out on our information center under the TV. So pick one of those up and, um, and consider. Today we're, we're focusing on uh, number four here, but you can read about all of those ministry priorities. So we're focusing in on number four, which is encouraging evangelism. And as we start, I just want to draw your attention to that word encouraging. What does that word communicate? Why didn't we just say evangelize the lost or, or pursue evangelism? We use that because it communicates a really important aspect of our evangelism philosophy as a church. And that is this. We believe the primary responsibility in evangelism lies with each one of us individually. If evangelism was, was instead primarily the responsibility of the local church, not the individual, and the churches um, could and do um, organize, evan you know, huge evangelistic programs, like musical concerts and, and basketball tournaments and VBS and, and have a gifted speaker come and skillfully present the gospel message. And, and that would accomplish the evangelism priority um, that God requires if evangelism is primarily the responsibility of the church. But Jesus called each of his disciples to be fishers of men, Matthew 4, 19. And we're likewise called to go and what? Make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. And so we believe that evangelism is primarily an individual responsibility rather than something is, is accomplished through church programs. Now, as we'll talk about later, um, it doesn't mean that we don't have any programs. We'll, um, there's real value, I believe, in, in combining our efforts in organized evangelism. Um, t tonight is an example, the Backyard Bible, Bible Club, where we're having a number of our families come together, and, and, uh, and we're going to be presenting the gospel there to those kids. But that's not the, the primary means by which we evangelize the lost in our community. You are the means by which the gospel is going to penetrate the neighborhoods and the businesses and the households and the lives of people in our community for the glory of God. So then our, our goal is to encourage, to, to give you courage as you pursue the God -given, this God-given responsibility. And now I'd like to share with you seven different ways that we're trying to do that. We're trying to encourage evangelism. I hope this list um, will show you that we have a heart for evangelism as a church. We're committed to sharing the hope of the gospel in our community. Um, we, we've not chosen to have really big evangelistic programs, but we're serious about evangelism. And, and I believe that we have a, a solid philosophy in place, um, even though we, we certainly have room for improvement. We're willing to admit that and, and even just communication about what, what we have here in place. Um, but we do have a plan, I believe, that is biblically based. And so we'd like to walk through that. First of all, the first as aspect of that plan, as listed on your handout, is is number one, exemplifying. Exemplifying. We believe that elders should set an example of evangelistic faithfulness. Elders should set an example of evangelistic faithfulness. And yet being an, you know, being an example doesn't mean that the elders are in any way uh, the best evangelists. Sometimes I, uh, I stop to consider the fact that some of you here have been sharing the gospel with others like before I was born. And, uh, and that's, that's not a comment on your age. It's just the, the reality. Um, that's, that's kind of humbling. And that's, it's, it's amazing. It's remarkable. The reality is that um, some of you are undoubtedly more skilled. Um, you're more experienced. You're more gifted in evangelism. And yet the Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy, a young leader in ministry, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, 
and purity. And later he would charge Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And so even though as, as elders, uh, we have the responsibility to, to care for the, the flock over which God has, has made us overseers, and even though we may not be as skilled as someone with uh, giftedness in evangelism, as, as some of you are, we also believe that we're not exempt from that personal, that personal responsibility to, to evangelize the lost. And so, for example, if, if you've gotten to know Pastor, um, Pastor Eric, you know that he thrives on uh, using his business contacts to, to every possible opportunity to share the gospel. You may also be aware that on, on m- most Monday mornings, Pastor Tim is at the hospital for several hours uh, volunteering as a chaplain so he can, he can talk about Jesus with suffering people in our community. You know, in, in past years, I've had the privilege of serving in a, in a prison ministry, in nursing homes, and uh, inner city kids mission. But this stage of my life, um, I say my primary evangelistic opportunities are my children. Um, those people that I just see throughout the week, uh, neighbors, delivery men, grocery clerks, parents at the park, you might call that just everyday evangelism. And that may be kind of your situation. You know, on Thursday, I was, I was thinking, I was praying about um, how I want to continue to grow as an evangelist. And I'm staring there in that lobby, and uh, I just, I look out the window, and there sitting on the curb is these, these uh, landscape guys that are, that are taking a break for their lunch. And so here I am, I'm praying about this. I'm like, you know, this is what God wants me to do. I took a couple of Spanish tracks and, and a couple of bottles of water and went out there and, and talked to them about Jesus, share the gospel with them. Evangelism, it doesn't have to be a, a scheduled event, even though, you know, chaplaincy, and there are opportunities like that, and, and that's, that's terrific. But for some of you, it's, it's just going to be a mindset. Are you walking throughout your week and your day looking for, for people that you can share hope of salvation with? So first of all, you know, we try to encourage evangelism at GBC by exemplifying it as, as elders. And secondly, that we want to encourage evangelism through equipping. Equipping. Ephesians 4, 11 to 12 says that pastors and teachers have been given as gifts to the church by Christ in order to equip the saints, that's you, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. According to one Bible dictionary, this word equipping has the idea of making someone completely adequate or sufficient for something. I know some of you, um, you teens, you kids, don't want to think about going back to school. Um, I, there's others of you, though, that are probably really excited um, about school, almost to the, you know, when can it happen? This last week, uh, Josiah, my six-year-old, um, that we received some new school books, and he just could not wait to open them up, and he's like reading the books. I'm like, wait, just wait for school year, you know? I have to be so excited. So there's kids in here I know that reflect both uh, different views about school. But imagine with me that your school semester has started, all right? And, uh, and your, your first day there, your science teacher is explaining how you are going to build a rocket that's going to fly up into space. That sounds pretty awesome, right? So they finish this. You're, you're so excited to begin building, and the, ne- the teacher never gives you any tools to put all the pieces together. And so uh, y- you might be able to manage, but I mean, how much easier to, to build it up if you had the tools you need? Um, imagine with me that you show up for your first day on, on the job site. Some of you teens have started working, um, working a new job this summer, and your employer he doesn't give you any training before he's sending you out as a salesperson for a certain product. <laughs> be like in a terrifying. You don't know how you're supposed to start a conversation or um, answer people's questions. And again, you, you could probably figure it out, but how much better would it be if you, you were trained, you were equipped for that? So when it comes to encouraging evangelism as a church, our job is to equip you with training and resources that you need to reach the lost with the gospel, and to do, uh, to do the work of ministry, to make disciples, to build up the body of Christ. That equipping then has two components, training and resources. Um, so I'd like to just talk about both of those briefly here, um, training and resources. Um, GBC has, has worked through uh, various evangelism um, training courses in the past. Um, 
We're planning to hold a, a new evangelistic training course early in early next year, 2022. So just kind of note that on your calendar, even though we're still nailing that down on the 2022 calendar. It'll, it'll be a six to eight week, you know, probably six to eight week small group study where we learn about evangelism, we talk about it, we practice it with one another. So there's, there's training. There's also resources. In addition to to training and instruction, we want to provide resources that would be helpful for you. And so <clears throat> um, we're committed to equipping you to put tools in your toolbox so you can reach the lost. Um, and just a comment about our resources, please be patient with us. Um, we're still working to kind of clarify and to, to refine and improve what we have. But we're really thankful. By God's grace, Pastor Tim has been able to, to develop some, I think, really helpful evangelistic um, and discipleship resources over the past 17 years. Some of you know about these. Others of you um, have never heard about these before. And um, for some of you, it's going to be really helpful to be reminded, though, um, that we do have these and, and then knowing where they are. So um, I'm just going to hi highlight two, two of these resources in particular this morning. One is um, Message of the Bible. Um, we actually have two formats for the Message of the Bible. Um, the first format is, is like a little Bible study booklet. Um, you can work through with someone who has some religious background, but doesn't really have a good understanding of what the Bible is all about. Um, it's kind of like an expanded tract <clears throat> um, that explains the gospel more thoroughly. It's like, I think it's like 25 pages. It has um, four different themes, uh, four chapters that, um, that really quickly but carefully walk through the main message of the Bible. So God's creation, his authority, humanity's purpose, and then his uh, man's sin, rebellion against God, Christ's sacrifice for sin, and then the personal choice that each of us has to make. And so if someone has questions about God, someone you know, you, you could sit down with them, take an hour or two, and walk through this, um, this booklet. They would have a clear presentation of the gospel by the time you finish this. That may be a little bit much to sit down and take all that in um, at one time. So another idea would just be to take, take a, a couple chapters, a couple of those themes, and work through those um, so that you, ha you can be able to talk about it. So, so meeting up a couple times. So that's, um, that's one a format for the message of the Bible. Uh, I think that we will be probably updating this at some point uh, soon, uh, but these would um, probably be available for you just about any time in the information center, which is under the TV there in the lobby. So that's the message of the Bible in booklet form. And then there's the message of the Bible uh, uh, video, which is a, how many of you have seen that before? Message of the Bible? Okay, wow. That's actually not that very many people. So um, the message of the Bible is, is on our website. You can access it there. You can also just go onto YouTube and search message of the Bible, and ours will pop up there. It's, it's, one of the top, if not the top one. Um, and, and so if you don't have a physical resource with you, you don't have a tract, just everybody has their phone, pull up your phone and just pull up message of the Bible. Just watch that video with them and ask them, you know, what did you think about that? What, what questions do you have? Pastor Tim clearly exp explains uh, the gospel, presents the gospel. And in these like visualization, there's like this, um, I think it's your brother, is it right? That, that draws, um, yeah, what is that called? It's just a, it's just an illustration of the gospel, and so it's, it's very attractive. It's, it's very easy to, to watch and interesting, and, and hopefully it'll be effective in, um, in you being able to, to bring the gospel before somebody else. And you don't have to explain all of it. It's, you know, you, you can just watch it there with them and then ask them what they, what they have questions about, what they don't understand. Message of the Bible is, is one of the resources um, that we hope you'll take advantage of. And then secondly is the Restore Study. It's a big book up here. Um, so uh, the second res resource that we want to highlight is um, one that Pastor Tim wrote back in 2015. Um, it's a 10-week Bible study uh, that's a type of resource that's been written so that someone without a lot of Bible knowledge at all <clears throat> um, could really easily follow along. Um, and yet also for someone that's a mature Christian that's just really um, facing brokenness in their life, um, we're just doing a Bible study to be able to work through uh, these. Uh, it's based on the message of the Jewish prophets there who were, who were broken people, and they were bringing God's hope to, to hurting people. And so you could do, do this 10-week study on your own. You could do it with someone else. Um, we have a number of copies of this in our new church library, uh, which is up in room four. And um, if you'd like to take a copy 
uh, to work through with someone else that you know, or you want to give it as a gift, um, just come and tell us uh, who you're giving this to, uh, who you're going to work through with. We'll just, we'll write their name down and we'll pray um, for them with you. And uh, we, uh, we want you to take, uh, take one of these and use it, um, if, it would, if it would help. Um, by the way, just a comment there about that church library um, while I'm on that. Uh, we're excited to have that up there. We moved our Next Steps library there, which we'll talk about some other time. It's, it's basically Next Steps towards God, uh, towards others, and then towards the lost. And you'll see those three bookshelves. If you do want to check out a book, uh, we don't have a device up there to check things out. But um, if you just tell one of the pastors, we'll eventually be getting a device up there. But if you want to check out one of those books, you're welcome to. Thankful to have that, that all together in our books here. This, again, I told you this is a little different sermon um, covering these resources, but hopefully these will be helpful in equipping you to evangelize the lost. We have a lot of other great resources. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever watched our Share the Truth video series. Pastor Tim is a few years younger in those videos. Um, but it's, they're really good um, just because he was younger. Doesn't mean they're not really, really encouraging. What? <laughs> One day you're going to look back at when I was younger and, uh, and say, yeah, it was still encouraging. <clears throat> um, okay, this is not on my script, so back, back to what I'm supposed to be saying here. The Share the Truth video series is like, I think it's 62 videos that are like a couple minutes long, and they're just, they're just really devotional thoughts to, to encourage you in evangelism. And so maybe you're like, I just need, I need a, a schedule, maybe just for two months here. I'm just going to watch one of the vid vid those videos every morning. And, and be encouraged to, to have a, a mindset that, that walks throughout my day saying, who, who can I share the gospel with? Or what should my heart be um, as, I'm, as I'm going about my day with a, with a heart of evangelism? So um, share the Truth video series. It's on our website. It's also on our, our YouTube channel. Uh, we have an online tract you can find if you go to the Message of the Bible page on our website. It's called Life's Choice Step. And, and it's an online tract you can just walk through with someone. Uh, gives just the basics of, of the gospel. And then we have print resources like this Two Roads tract, which I really like. It's kind of a—we'll we'll have this out on our information table a lot of uh, Sundays. And so, you know, you pass, pass one or a couple of these out through in the week and just grab a couple more on a Sunday. And, um, you know, put them, put them in, your, in your car right there on your side, uh, in, my, in your door. So every time you're going to get out, you're just like, oh, there's a tract. I should take that with me and give it to somebody. We have Essential Jesus. Um, this is a, is a translation of the Gospel of Luke with a lot of um, footnotes and explanations for someone who hasn't read the Bible before. It's basically a Gospel of Luke and a tract that's combined. It's a really a nice booklet. Um, so to summarize these really quickly, these different resources, and we have more, but um, the message of the Bible would be for someone with um, some religious background. The Essential Jesus non-religious background. Somebody that, that just doesn't know Christ at all. And, and, uh, and then the restore study, someone that would have a, you have a, a relationship with, you have a previous relationship with. So those are a couple ideas um, for how those, could, how those could, could fit in with the people that you encounter on a weekly basis. If you have any questions about those resources, um, you know, what to use with a certain individual, we'd love for you to come and, and talk to us. We can recommend a resource. We can pray with you about that person. We want to encourage evangelism and, and equip you for that. And so uh, this is part of that. I know that was a little bit longer, that point, um, but it's, it's, it's really important, as all of them are. Let's move to number three, provoking. Foundations of GBC says believers should be encouraging, challenging, praying for, and helping one another in evangelism. Hebrews 10.25 addresses the importance of not neglecting to meet together as Christians. Remember that verse? But one of the reasons the writer has to say that is because in verse 24, he says, we must stir one another up to love and good works. And that is part of why we come together, to encourage one another, to stir one another up. And part of that encouragement centers on evangelism. We have Discipleship Connect. We have prayer meetings after our Sunday morning services. Um, and, and par, you know, part of why these are, these are designed partly to, to give you an opportunity to, 
encourage one another um, in evangelism. But you, you don't have to wait for one of those to, um, to provoke one another, to encourage one another. Consider just asking one of your friends um, on Sunday or somebody that you don't know here. Um, ask them who, who they recently shared the gospel with. Um, who they would like to evangelize. And then just stop and pray with them about, about that person together, uh, the, that situation. Um, follow up to hear how it's going. Write the person's name down. Right? Pray for them. Evangelism is, is primarily a, a personal responsibility, but that doesn't mean that you have to do it on your own. Apostle Paul asked the church at Ephesus to pray for him to have boldness to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, Ephesians 6.19. So I, I know that some of you have, um, you've run together before, you've worked out together, uh, some of you have been on the same diet, and, and, and as you do that, you're encouraging one another. You, you ask, how was this week for you? Or, How'd you do? That's the type of provoking that's, that's healthy and, and biblical when it's applied to evangelism. Pray for one another, encourage one another as you per- pursue evangelism together. So, um, just you know, after the service, you just pick out one person. Um, how is evangelism going with you? Who, who are you praying about that you would, you would like to, to share the gospel with? Number four, preaching. Foundations of GBC says the gospel should be clearly explained and proclaimed in public worship services. Unbelievers may join together with the church family in these services, and not all of those who regularly attend have been genuinely born again. That's, that's true. There are people in this room, um, possibly, that, that have never accepted Christ, though they may have, have attended for, for many years, including, including those kids that are upstairs right now um, being taught in children's church. So the reality is, you know, we have guests. We have um, regular members, uh, regular attenders every Sunday, um, so, some people that have not placed their faith in Christ, I'm sure, in a, in a room this large. So I'd encourage you to, encourage you to, to make a point to, to meet those who haven't met bef- you met, who haven't met before at GBC, um, ask them when they come to know Jesus as their Savior. Our worship um, in song and, and our preaching is not going to be specifically designed for an unsaved audience, but I mean, you, you listen to those songs this morning, and we're always seeking to clearly explain the gospel um, and call pe- people to respond to the gospel and through these things. Um, but in addition to that, just, just take opportunities here um, after the preaching, after our services, to, um, to talk with people about, about the gospel. Ask them how they came to know, to know Christ. Um, ask the kids, you know, when they come down. Um, we have a lot of people in this church that are unsaved, and they're under the age of, uh, well, I won't say, because um, there's a lot of unsaved kids. You know what? Just go and ask my kids. I, I know that most of them are unsaved. Ask them what, you know, what Jesus did for them on the cross. Remind them of the gospel. Oh, how, how important. That's, that's what I want for my kids. I want you, the church family, to be, to be sharing the gospel with them and, and asking them about these things. So, number four is preaching. Number five is combining combining. What does that mean? Even though we see evangelism as, again, I've said it a couple times, primarily our personal responsibility, there's great value in working together as a team, as, as the body of Christ. So there's, there's different types of combined evangelistic efforts um, that we organize as a church. Some of these are church-wide outreaches, um, and some are smaller, just with a few families. So let me just give you an, one example of each. Um, GBC has held community seminars in the past, some of you haven't, uh, have come after, you know, you've never been to one of those, but they're, um, they require a lot of manpower, organization, and they're, but they're designed to, to reach the community with teaching about relevant issues like anger and grief and conflict and stress from a biblical perspective and, and um, the gospel is presented. And the Hope Fund uh, was, was started to support these community seminars and, and the Restore study, and, you know, we're, we're we're continuing to work on plans to take that fund, the Hope Fund, and utilize it even better to bring the gospel um, to this community. Uh, that, that is the heart of GBC. It's in our website name, findhope.net. Um, it's why, um, it, it's been a past part of Pastor Tim's heart since, since the very beginning. It's why the church's first outreaches in 2003 were oriented towards hope. 
Uh, it's part of the reason why he loves being in the hospital and uh, why we've done community seminars and the Restore study. And we, we each have different giftedness and, and avenues we use for outreach, but that, that has always been an important part of, of Pastor Tim's heart. And so in addition to church-wide outreach activities, we also have um, smaller outreach um, opportunities like the Backyard Bible Club that's, that's starting tonight at, um, at 6.30. I'm not sure how small it's going to be, um, this smaller outreach. I, I think it could be anywhere from like 20 to 40 kids there um, in our small backyard. It's going to be exciting. Uh, but we have, um, we're planning to, to have a few families from our church who are going to come and help us with that. Um, so it's not church-wide, but, um, you know, in fact, if, if you want to come and, uh, and observe and watch, I mean, this is the type of thing that you could do in your neighborhood with a few other church families coming together. We're going to have um, an active game time that's really simple with some, you know, dodgeballs and, and soccer balls. And, and then we're going to have a, uh, a lesson time where we're sharing the gospel with these kids. We're going to sing a song, uh, learn a verse. We're going to have a snack time, and then we're going to end with a review game that's really going back over that content in the, the teaching time. And uh, we're excited about um, the, the number of kids that have already said they're interested in coming to, uh, to this Backyard Bible Club. Um, if you'd like to come, maybe just let us know that you're, uh, you're headed our way, and we'd love to have you come. And just, just watch or, or talk with some of the parents that are there. We'd love that. This goes beyond a kid's event, though. Um, small outreaches. You know, if there are a few people in your neighborhood or community that you would like to invite for dinner— those that you don't know if they're, if they're lost, um, consider inviting another church family along with you uh, to, you know, help you with the food, help you with conversation there around the table. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to, you know, have to share the gospel with them after they finish dessert, you know, sit them down and walk through the plan of salvation. But you will have an opportunity to, to share the love of Christ that saved you there. You know, if you, um, I'd encourage you to, uh, if you haven't done so, um, read the book by Rosaria Butterfield, um, Gospel Comes with a House Key. I don't know if you've heard of that before. There's also a video, like a six-minute video I wanted to share today, but I don't have time, that talk, where she talks about um, how she was invited into someone's home. And it was, it was a number of months before she was kind of um, willing to accept, to, to, to actually talk about the gospel. But it's a really fascinating story, and I encourage you to, to check that out. Number six is baptizing. It's important to remember that evangelism is part of making disciples. Evangelism is part of making disciples. Um, Pastor Tim has explained before in his message on discipleship that evangelism is the first step of discipling, uh, helping someone take the first step in following Jesus. Um, but there are a lot more steps to take after that, right? In, in discipling. And so in Jesus' great commission to his followers in Matthew 28, his call to make disciples involves baptizing them and teaching them God's word. Every believer needs to be added to the local church where they can grow and mature as disciples. And so, so baptism is just the, um, it's the initial part of our overall commitment to disciple making and making sure our, our personal evangelism is directly connected to the local church. Number seven, planting locally and globally. Uh, the local church is the center of what God is doing in the world today. So evangelism must lead to, to baptism and discipleship, gathering new believers in, um, in local churches. You know, sometimes um, uh, this will involve starting new churches as you know, population shifts, um, community grows, there's, there's need for new churches. Uh, no matter where we look around the world, we can find both churches that need to be strengthened and supported, and as well as areas that, that need brand new churches. Um, GBC was a church plant. Um, and from the very beginning, chur church planting is really the part of the DNA of GBC. Healthy churches reproduce. Uh, God has led us to be involved in church planting in many places around the world um, through jo George and Lexi Binoka. Uh, our partner, missions partners, um, they have a new church plant among the South Sudanese refugees in Kenya. We're part of that. Through our missions partners, um, we're part of a new church plant in Istanbul, Turkey. <clears throat> of course, we've, we've spent the last year heavily involved with the ministry in Togo, West Africa. Um, as you know, as you got to know the Kendalls, you, you realize that um, their heart is for more than just the hospital there. They're all about um, 
church uh, maturing and, and planting there in, in West Africa. So uh, we may be involved, we, we are involved in church planting all around the world. But we want to always remember that, that the need's much closer to home. Uh, we did plant another church in Southern California um, more than a de- decade ago, and, and we look forward to when God allows us to be a part of a church planting again. You know, it may be that, um, that some of you uh, who are completely unaware of it right now, that God is actually preparing you uh, to help with a church plant some year down the road. It's kind of exciting to think about, right? We're going to conclude um, today by, um, by reading the vision that we have uh, for encouraging evangelism at GBC. I, I included these on the back of your handout. These vision statements relate to the, the seven words that we just covered. By God's grace, this is, this is what we're committed to pursuing at GBC for the glory of God. Our vision is that the GBC church family would be evangelistically faithful as a result of the faithful example of their leaders. It's our vision that each GBC member would have the theological and practical tools needed to to make the gospel clear to others and would have a thorough understanding of and convenient access to the evangelistic tools that are available to them through GBC. It's our vision that GBC church family would regularly encourage one another to personal evangelism and faithfully support evangelistic endeavors through prayer. It's our vision that each unsaved person who attends a service at GBC would hear the gospel, be urged to respond to it through the public preaching and those private interactions with the GBC family. It's our vision that the combined evangelistic efforts of the GBC family would exceed the possibilities of our individual efforts alone, that every born again person would attend GBC with um, and would joyfully obey the command to be baptized. And, And then number seven, our vision is that our other churches might be planted, both locally and internationally, through the generos- generosity, the ministry, and the prayer of GBC. I hope that today um, the goal was accomplished, that you've been encouraged, that you're excited, and that you're equipped for this personal responsibility that you have and the mission that we have as a church to make disciples Jesus Christ. Let's pray and ask for his help as we go out to do this. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Father, we have been entrusted um, as vessels of clay with the glorious, invaluable gospel to share with those who are in darkness, to share with those who are are broken and without hope, a world gone wrong. Um, God, we're a little bit scared. We're, we're fearful. We're also just proud and selfish with our time. And, and we need your spirit to work in our hard hearts to, to propel us into this community with life-saving truth. The gospel will bring eternal life. Father, I pray that you, oh, you will use these truths and, um, and we'll, we'll go out changed um, as a result, that you'll just continue to work in us uh, a desire and, um, and passion for souls so that your glory would be just multiplied all across the globe and, and especially here in, in Marietta in Southern California. We love you and we desire to love people more because that's what's going that's what's going to really propel us to, to talk with them about the greatest news the good news of the gospel. Please help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful day.